big island of Hawaii, there was a disaster brewing. Like many farmers, Rusty Perry's livelihood was based on the papaya, a sweet-tasting fruit and one of Hawaii's most important crops. Then a lethal disease, the papaya ring spot virus, began decimating the plantations. We first found it in, uh, I think it was late 93, and by 94 it was starting to become a real problem, and by 95 we had lost most of our fields. We had uh, about 14 non-family employees. We went down to one. Dennis and Carol Gonzalez, two Hawaiian molecular biologists working at Cornell University, came to see the damage for themselves. Yeah. It's going to be amazing. Look at that tree over there. Typical symptoms of papaya ring spot. These are the shoestring of the leaves over here. Then look at this ring spot here. This is the, why they call it papaya ring spot. Here. Boy, those fruit are terrible. Yeah, and this farm is not Never going to make any money. Nothing seemed to stop the virus. Not physical barriers, not chemical pesticides. And most farmers were resigned that within a few years, the $45 million papaya industry would be gone forever. Back in New York State at Cornell University, Dennis and Carol Gonzalez searched for a solution. They wondered if the cutting-edge technology of genetic engineering might help. Genes are the chemical instructions in each cell that govern how plants and animals reproduce and grow. Gonzalez's colleagues had been manipulating them since the 70s. Many medicines, from insulin to AIDS drugs, were now genetically engineered. Perhaps, he thought, the same techniques could help plants as well. Even though plants don't have immune systems, Gonzalez thought it might be possible to protect them against a future infection. Among the many genes making up the ring spot virus, Gonzalez identified one that made a harmless protein in the virus's outer coat. If he could splice this gene into the papaya chromosome, making a transgenic papaya, then perhaps the papaya would be protected, in effect, vaccinated against future infection. But how do you get genes into plants? Scientists at Cornell had invented a crude but effective way called the gene gun. The ammunition is genes. The target, a plant. The shot is propelled by compressed gas. Magnified many times, the process works like this. First, tens of thousands of copies of the desired viral gene are made. Next, they're mixed with tiny tungsten balls to which the genes stick. When the balls are fired, the genes are carried along into the leaf. As the balls pass through the plant, some of the genes get inserted into some of the cells. These transformed cells can be grown in culture to become new plants, transgenic plants. Consolvis grew hundreds of transgenic papaya plants in dishes and subjected them to chemical tests. In a few, the new viral gene appeared to be working. Now came the moment of truth. Would genetically modified papaya plants be killed by the ring spot virus, or would they resist? The real severe and the best test is after the gene is in, you rub the plants with um, an isolate of the virus to see if it actually indeed uh, withstands infection. This here is the virus-infected plant. The effect of the virus is on the leaves and also on the fruit. On the leaves, the leaves instead of being full are narrow and they also show this yellowing here as opposed to the uh, genetically engineered papaya here 
this the leaf is a normal looking papaya leaf is fully green and the growth is very good now the only difference here is that this one plant has the one gene making it resistant to the virus a decade of work had produced a breakthrough and perhaps saved an industry if genetic engineering could protect a papaya from a lethal virus why stop there at Cornell, a world center of agricultural science, researchers were hard at work genetically engineering crops. Some were working on getting medicines into plants. Others were striving to make crops like rice more nutritious. But the early 90s was also a time when scientists speculated about exotic possibilities which might never make it into commercial products. For example, by splicing a gene from a firefly into a tobacco seed, Scientists could produce tobacco plants that would glow whenever they needed watering. Another idea was to splice a gene that enables an arctic flounder to tolerate cold into a strawberry to protect it from frost damage. While such speculations did not turn into commercial products, the new science of agricultural biotechnology had attracted the attention of some large corporations. Monsanto, an agrochemical company, realized that biotechnology might offer a way out of the pesticide business, which had become increasingly unprofitable. Further development in pesticides was no longer um, a viable business opportunity and from an environmental point of view didn't really make sense either so we um, stopped all chemical investment and really redirected our energy towards um, biotech. Hiring hundreds of researchers Monsanto set out to build a new industry. The first products were aimed squarely at their traditional customers the same farmers who had bought their herbicides, pesticides and fertilizers. Farmers like Gerald Tumbleson, who farms in southern Minnesota. 85% of the food we eat comes from large farms like this. On 2,700 acres, Gerald Tumbleson grows only two crops, corn and soy. Americans have come to expect cheap food. So to stay in business, Tumbleson is continually looking to technology to cut his costs. Satellite navigation, the latest combine harvesters, and heavy use of pesticides and fertilizers. He was hoping that Monsanto's genetic technology could help him get rid of a big pest, the European corn borer caterpillar. They burrow into the stalk and then it rots the inside of the stalk. They burrow into the shank that holds the ear and it rots that and the wind comes up and the corn falls off. Now, to keep that from happening, if we spray our field with an insecticide. But we can't get selective. We spray for an insect, and we might get four or five that we don't want dead, and we've killed them. Monsanto had a solution to sell. Corn, which made its own pesticide. Scientists had long known that a humble soil bacterium called Bacillus thuringiensis, or Bt, produced toxins that killed caterpillars. Monsanto scientists spliced the bacterial gene that made the toxin into corn. Now, every cell of the modified corn makes its own pesticide, a chemical protein harmless to most insects and to humans whose bodies rapidly break it down, but lethal to the corn borer caterpillar. In Monsanto's greenhouses, scientists put Bt genes into other crops, soy, potatoes, and into the most intensively sprayed crop of all, cotton. Because Bt crops replace pesticides, many scientists believe genetic engineering could help save the environment. Cotton is the world's number one user of pesticides. It is ironic to me that we think of cotton as a natural fiber and we don't understand that it is a major pollutant environmentally. And BT cotton presents us with an opportunity 
to reduce the amount of pesticides that we're spraying on our crops. That not only has an environmental implication, but has a major implication for the people who actually have to handle the pesticides and do the spraying. If you've ever been around here when you've sprayed an insecticide, if you've ever used that, we put it on, we put you know, leather gloves on and, 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 and um, coveralls on so it doesn't get on us, that is not a fun thing. That is not something I even want to dream about. I don't even want the thing in my machine shed with my grandkids around. But those are the type of things we don't have to have with this BT corn. Along with soybeans, which were genetically modified to manage weeds with much less herbicide, the BT crops were received enthusiastically. Within a couple of years, the majority of soy and cotton, and a third of all corn, were genetically modified. Farmers like Gerald Tumbleson were convinced that biotechnology had the power to transform agriculture. We're going to be raising things on this land, on this soil, that we haven't even dreamt of in, in 10 to 15 years. I envy my sons because they're just getting started in a time which I think, to me, is very important. By 1996, grain handlers were treating GM crops like any other grain. They mixed them in with non-GM crops and shipped them to food processors all over America. Because corn and soy are used in hundreds of products, these genetically modified organisms, or GMOs, rapidly found their way into everything from cereals to sodas, and into the stomachs of millions of Americans. Consumers had no idea this had been happening to their food. Even environmental groups had said little about the issue. One exception was Jeremy Rifkin, a longtime critic of biotechnology. For two decades, he had tried to get the public interested. It seemed to me we needed to have a thorough and thoughtful global discussion on the potential environmental implications of reseeding the earth with genetically modified organisms. Rifkin would get his debate but only when GM food left the U.S. loaded on ships bound for other nations, like Japan and the countries of the European Union. Within months of arriving in Europe, it was clear that the fortunes of GM food were about to change. You start to see it first of all in Germany and Austria, where there was almost a paranoia about anything to do with genetic modification. Um, eugenics as an issue is a very, very sensitive one because of recent history in, in Germany. And I think it was there that you first start to see real public concern. It was from Germany and Austria that the ball really started to roll, and it didn't stop there. Environmental groups like Greenpeace International staged demonstrations in country after country, even dumping GM soy in front of the British Prime Minister's residence. The public are becoming quite skeptical about the ability of scientific evidence to tell us all we need to know about potentially irreversible innovations and genetic engineering seems to be crossing those boundaries of what we can know and should do. Europe was already reeling from another unrelated food crisis. Mad cow disease was condemned as a disastrous failure of science and regulation. The confidence in government agencies to stand up for people and not roll over to, for, to, to private companies who were trying to make a profit was just not there. Farmers had their GM crops pulled up. Food companies had their brands targeted. Supermarkets were pressured to dump GMOs from their shelves. There was now a broad-based popular movement angry that GM food had been introduced without consultation. In Europe, there's a seamless web between culture and cuisine. The way food is grown, the way uh, the agricultural areas are preserved, the way food is processed and served, all of that 
is a deep statement of the values of each country in which that food is grown. The Europeans were saying, we don't want a handful of life science companies to undermine the cultural values behind our food and food policies in Europe. There's no benefit to European consumers, uh, and there are risks, of course, and so it's quite logical if you uh, weigh up the fact there are no benefits and there are risks that you'll be against them. At the moment, all the benefits are going to uh, American farmers, and I think uh, uh, that isn't appreciated in Europe. As public opinion hardened, the European Union voted for a ban. No new genetically modified organisms would be commercialized until further notice and all imported GMOs would have to be labeled. The scale of the European opposition called into question the entire future of GM food. U.S. exports would be affected, but far more important to U.S. companies was the risk that American consumers might turn against GM food, which had now penetrated throughout the $600 billion U.S. food industry. At the University of New Mexico, political scientist Hank Jenkins Smith has embarked on a major opinion survey about genetically modified organisms. Do you currently eat any genetically modified foods or foods that include genetically modified ingredients? How do you feel about the following options? He wants to know if we are likely to reject GMOs like the Europeans. The stakes are high. Food is such an intimate thing for most people. We consume those items. We take them into our bodies. Um, we're dependent on the uh, producers of those foods to make sure that they're safe, um, that they are of high quality. That's what makes it such a fascinating public policy question. In designing surveys, researchers use focus groups to get an idea of what snippets people have picked up about a controversy. Have any of you eaten? genetically modified foods to the best of your knowledge? Not knowingly. Yeah. Only roughly 20% of the people we talked to would say yes, that they do eat genetically modified organisms. A fair number simply say they don't know, and then the majority say no, they don't. <laughs> any of you ever consume any of that? Yes. Mm -hmm. We're getting close to home here? Uh -oh. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. This is soy oil. Oh, no. health <laughs> soybean oil. <laughs> Cheese. The research is clear. Most Americans have no idea they've been eating GM foods for over five years. And when they find out, they get upset. And this is... Uh, this is and, why, and, why, and, why and why weren't we allowed to be in on that? Yeah. What is it going to do to my daughter? What is it going to do to my eight-year-old little boy when he... You know, for reproducing later on? Is there going to be a problem? A key element of any controversy is trust. Europeans didn't trust their regulators. What about Americans? The Department of Agriculture, interestingly, gets quite high ratings of trust. Um, on a scale of 0 to 10, where 0 is not at all trusted and 10 is completely trusted, they rank close to a 7. Um, and we don't see agencies that get that high very often. Not far behind them comes the FDA. Suppose a spokesperson from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency said the risk... But as happened in Europe with mad cow disease, trust in regulators can be lost overnight. It's a critical time. If there were to be some event that galvanized public concern, you can change an issue like this substantially, as Three Mile Island did, for example, with the, with the nuclear um, technology policy debate. We haven't seen such a thing yet. More than half of the human... And if it were to happen, it could be devastating. To the best of your knowledge, have most scientists concluded that genetically modified foods are unsafe for human consumption, safe for human consumption, or they haven't yet reached the conclusion? Unraveling the truth about GM foods means confronting some difficult questions. Are scientists tampering with nature? Will genetically modified organisms damage the environment? Does the world really need GMOs? But first, a more fundamental question. How do we know they're safe to eat?
coming years, biotech companies have plans to introduce dozens of new genetically modified organisms. Vegetables, fruits, nuts, and more. What guarantees do we have that these GMOs will be safe to eat? We spent a long part of our history testing various things we could eat, and a lot of people have died as part of this grand experiment to see what we could consume. Here, for the first time in history, because we're introducing genes from novel sources, we're introducing genes that code for proteins we've never put in the human body. Many of them will be safe, I'm sure. Will most of them be safe? Nobody knows. You can't prove that it's safe. You can't prove that any new technology that we have in the world today is absolutely safe. Whether you have a mobile phone that you're listening to, whether that affects you, whether overhead power lines affect you, whether if you're a woman and you take a birth control pill or you take hormone replacement therapy, we cannot, in any of those circumstances, prove that it's absolutely safe. What you can do is try and minimize the risks by doing proper testing, and that's what we have to do with genetically modified foods. Biotech companies argue that's just what they've done. The new crops are tested for toxicity by feeding the genetically engineered proteins to mice in doses 1,000 times greater than humans would receive. According to Monsanto's chief operating officer, Hugh Grant, such tests have failed to find any evidence of harm. These are products, these are crops, they're technologies that have been more widely tested than any other food product that came before them in history. To test that the GM foods are substantially the same as their non-GM equivalents, company scientists compare the chemistry in minute detail. Molecule by molecule, they analyze the GM and non-GM crops. If the resulting graphs from a mass spectrometer line up exactly, the two products are chemically identical. This is what the regulators call substantial equivalence, and it's one reason GM foods normally do not require special labels. Most of these foods that are being changed are foods we know very well. Corn, soybeans, and the like. And what is being changed is usually something of very, to date, it has been something of very small uh, difference. The regulation of GMOs is shared between three agencies that treat them in the way they treat regular crops. The USDA checks they're safe to grow. The FDA checks they're safe to eat. And the EPA also gets involved with crops like BT corn that contain pesticides. I don't think we're going to have the same problems here that they have in Europe. And the simple reason why is because our food safety regulatory system is head and shoulders above anybody else's in the world. But critics worry that in regulating GMOs no differently from traditional foods, the agencies may be exposing the public to unknown risks like allergies. We know that 8% of children, 2% of adults have allergenic reaction to traditional foods. What we're dealing with is the introduction of new genetic foods that have genes that code for proteins that we've never consumed. We just don't know what the reaction's likely to be. At Cornell's Department of Food Science, scientist Joe Hotchkiss is an expert on food safety. Allergenicity is very, very difficult to predict. Uh, probably the most allergenic food is peanuts. There's a protein in peanuts which is a very serious allergen for a very very small portion of the population it's very difficult to find out who that population is unless they've had a very bad accident or episode people can avoid peanuts by looking at the labels the FDA insists upon but the ability to manipulate individual genes presents new challenges one biotech company actually engineered a gene from a Brazil nut into a soybean, making the soybean allergenic. If the soy had ended up in hundreds of products, individuals allergic to Brazil nuts might have unknowingly consumed a life-threatening food. But it never made the supermarket shelves. The allergy was picked up by a laboratory test. 
Scientists like Charles Arnson of Cornell believe the public should have confidence in GMOs because they are based on three decades of research. We've been working on this stuff since the 70s. We haven't had so much as a headache from any genetically modified food. And I think that's because we thought about these things. In the U.S., it's been science-driven. We have had great cooperation between federal agencies, but we've had the scientists who understand this and who developed it working on this all the way through. Despite such assurances, watchdog groups like the Union of Concerned Scientists believe this technology deserves special scrutiny. Their spokesperson is former EPA scientist Dr. Jane Rissler. You've heard industry say there's no evidence these foods are harmful, and after all, people in the United States have been eating them for several years now. Do you believe that statement? I mean, how are you affected by that? Isn't it a bit disingenuous? How would we know if someone had gotten ill from genetically engineered food if it's not labeled? I mean, how could there be evidence if they haven't, al if they haven't allowed the food to be labeled? They're now saying, well, there's no evidence of harm. But that's because they haven't allowed any way to track any harm. There is perhaps no better example of the difficulties of keeping track of GM food than the story of a corn called Starlink. Developed by Aventis, one of Monsanto's competitors, Starlink was intended for America's breakfast tables. But things didn't work out as planned. Starlink is identical to regular corn, except that it was engineered to make a toxin called Cry9C, one that Aventus had to prove was not an allergen. To test for this, scientists recreate in a test tube the chemical conditions of the human gut and time how long a new protein takes to break down. The longer it takes, the more likely it will be an allergen. Since Cry9C broke down relatively slowly, the EPA concluded it was a potential human allergen and approved it only for animal use. Convinced it was safe for humans, Aventus conducted more tests. Meanwhile, they decided to go ahead and sell it to farmers strictly for animal feed. The environmental group Friends of the Earth routinely checks agency releases for news of GM crop approvals. In July 2000, on an EPA website, they noticed Starlink and realized it might be very important. What are the potential health effects here? Well, it looks like it produces this protein that, that could be a food allergen. We learned that the Starlink corn, which has the bacterial toxin Cry9C in it, was not approved for human consumption, only for animal consumption. We were in conversations with farmers who were telling us that most farmers don't separate genetically engineered corn from conventional corn. Given that very little of the corn is separated and that there's a type of corn not approved for human consumption, I thought there's a good chance that it had made it into our food. I went into my local Safeway and I bought 23 different corn-based products. Boxes of corn flakes and taco shells and tortilla chips. I had a corn muffin mix, some corn meal, and also a couple of enchilada TV dinners. He took them back to the office and shipped them off to a laboratory with a single question. Do any of them contain the unapproved protein, Cry9C? The lab found Starlink corn in one product, taco shells made by Taco Bell. We double and triple checked the tests, knowing that consumer confidence, millions of dollars in the fate of farmers were all on the line here. Today, government officials say they are investigating reports that Taco Bell uses genetically modified corn that is only fit for animals. The action comes after the president. The next day, tacos were all over the news, and accusations were flying. The biotech industry says before any action is taken, the test results must be verified noting that the lab used in this case has been wrong before. These results uh, have been alleged by a company that has a history of finding things that aren't there. 
The Food and Drug Administration says it will conduct its own tests and order a recall if the taco shells do indeed contain the unlicensed corn. We have confirmed within our own labs that yes, um, this uh, did enter uh, the, the food supply. Whether it posed a true safety issue or a real health issue for the American consumer, I think is still very much in question. Suppose Friends of the Earth had never done this testing. Suppose that there are people who in fact are allergic to carnine C. Would we have known? Was someone eating a taco shell who got ill? Would that person say, oh my, there's genetically engineered corn in the taco shell? Well, how would a person know? The absence of evidence is not absence of harm. Consumer news now, a reminder that... I don't think that it demonstrates that the whole system is flawed. Clearly, this was an issue that has uh, been a very strong lessons learned for, I think, all of us. But how did corn meant for animals find its way into American stomachs? The company that developed this particular plant believed that they had a management program that would ensure that the growers of this corn would channel that product into feed use and keep it out of the food supply. Obviously, it didn't work. Aventus made a big mistake by assuming that thousands of people making decisions every day on their farms would be able to separate the starling corn from conventional corn. But harvest days last for 14 hours, farmers are driving late into the night, they're under a lot of pressure, farm prices are really low. There's even pressure for some people to sell the starling into the food system to get a higher price. There's so many reasons that the uh, starling corn could get into the food supply that it was uh, a risk that wasn't worth taking. At a cost of $500 million, Aventus has now withdrawn Starlink corn from the market, but not before it had spread all over the world. Starlink corn was found in Japan in a baking mix. It was found in Korea and in the UK and in Denmark. So contamination is worldwide. It's manipulation of the, 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 the natural order of things in a way that's against religious feeling almost. But scientists argue humans have been tampering with nature for a very long time. I don't like the word genetically modified food. Virtually all of our foods have been genetically modified. Um, if you take the apple, for example, there are literally dozens of varieties of apples how did we get those dozens of varieties? We genetically modified the apple through conventional breeding. We crossed one kind of apple with another apple and we produced very different apples, different color, different flavor, different functions. The fruits and vegetables we take for granted, scientists say, are not the way nature made them. They have all been genetically modified for our benefit. People think when they go to the store and buy potatoes or tomatoes or grapes that this is the way they always were in nature. In fact, that's not the case here. We have a, a, a wild variety of potato, in fact, which very much looks like the ancestor of this modern potato. This is the same uh, potato except for a few genes different that were introduced through breeding and selection. This is um, the same for tomato and it really is difficult to believe that um, using just basic selection and uh, crossbreeding over hundreds of years that you went from this ancestor to modern day uh, tomatoes. 
If crops bred by traditional methods are not natural, neither are they necessarily safe. The potato contains a naturally occurring chemical that's quite toxic called a glycoalkaloid. Those glycoalkaloids in some potatoes, as a matter of fact, have caused severe human poisonings and near death. When you breed potatoes, it's possible to breed in high levels of that toxicant into a potato. And as a matter of fact, there are a number of breeds of potatoes that have high levels. Fortunately, they did not make the marketplace for that reason. Another great example of the risks of traditional breeding is celery. Celery naturally contains a chemical when it hits sunlight, becomes toxic. There was a case in California where a new variety of celery was bred. It had unknown to the people who bred it high levels of this toxicant in it. It was planted, and the workers who harvested this came out with a very severe skin rash. So normal kind of breeding can produce risks just as any other genetic or other kinds of breeding can produce risks. So is GM technology simply a high-tech version of the tampering traditional breeders have been doing for centuries? Everyone agrees there are some significant differences. Classical breeders can only cross related plants, like two varieties of potato. And a cross involves mixing tens of thousands of genes at a time. Genetic engineering, by contrast, is much more precise, moving individual genes into plants. And it can also do something traditional breeders have never managed to do, move genes between different life forms, putting not just plant genes into plants, but genes from insects, animals, fish. You can cross a donkey and a horse in classical breeding. They're very close relatives, and you can get a mule. But you can't cross a donkey and an apple tree in classical breeding. What the public needs to understand is that these new technologies, especially recombinant DNA technology, allow scientists to bypass biological boundaries altogether. This is something we've never seen in 10,000 years of classical breeding. Moving genes across species to produce so-called transgenic life forms seems to many a radical step. One experiment proposed but never carried out to splice a flounder gene into a strawberry to protect it from frost has caught the public imagination. It's the stuff of fear and myth. When do we want it? What have we created? Fish or strawberry? You can almost see their nose wrinkling up because there's something about a fishy smell to a strawberry. And, and it's, it's a mental image. It's more than anything else. It's just, ooh, I wouldn't like that. Uh, it, it, it has nothing to do with the science, I believe. It's just the way we're, our, we're wired in our brain. A fish is supposed to smell like a fish and a strawberry like a strawberry. And it just superimposing words on each other gives us, we, we back off. We don't like that. The scientific view of nature holds that all living things, be they plants, animals, insects, are controlled by DNA. All are based on thousands of tiny genes that control the way things grow. Genes that are similar across all species, from humans to the food they eat. We probably share about 50% of our genes with plants. Take an example, there is a protein cytochrome C, which is a very important component of our respiratory uh, machinery, if you like. And this, this product, uh, cytochrome C, is identical in you, in a pea, in a cow. The, total, the absolute same gene. That gene is just a coding sequence. You do not find the whole essence of an organism in that gene. Scientists argue that since tens of thousands of genes go into making most animals and vegetables, moving a single gene doesn't change the essence of a life form. A tomato with, for example, a single pig vitamin gene is still only a tomato. Back in Hawaii, Dennis Gonzalez had to make a similar argument to U.S. regulators. 
that his transgenic papaya with a single gene from the ring spot virus is substantially the same as a regular papaya. For the USDA, he needed to field test his GM papaya and prove it didn't harm other plants and animals. So they have enough water going? The weather's been real good. And how many uh, acres do you have over here? He'd asked farmer Rusty Perry to carry out this trial. It's a big growth for uh, one month. Next, he had to submit data to the EPA that the GM papaya wouldn't adversely damage yeah, the environment. One month old. Finally, he had to convince the FDA that the papaya was safe to eat. We had to show FDA that our papaya was substantially equivalent to the non-transgenic papaya. That means the vitamins levels were about the same. It did not have any unusual properties except virus resistance. By the end of 1997, we had approvals from USDA, EPA, and FDA. The GM papayas were thriving. Oh, that's a beautiful uh, fruit. For Gonzalez and his collaborators from the University of Hawaii, Man, it was a moment of relief. Look at this one. Wow. wow, man. But they still had one other hurdle. The papaya they'd engineered wasn't theirs to use. While the GM papaya looked and tasted like a regular one, it owed its existence to years of sophisticated technology, costing millions to develop. Technology that universities and corporations had patented. It was time to hire a lawyer. Well, Dennis, as you know, I've been asked... Uh, Gonsalves had invented the GM papaya, but he needed intellectual property lawyer Mike Goldman to get it to market. This is from the companies that hold those patents, so I'm going to need you to explain to me uh, what uh, is in the transgenic papaya and how it was made. Okay, well, let me briefly show you this uh, genetic map that we have here. Our main component uh, basically was the uh, core protein gene, and both Cornell and Upjohn have filed a patent. Now, the other components we have is the 35S promoter here mm. to drive the gene. And this one here, as I understand it, is, uh, is patented by Monsanto. Yes. And right in here, we have the leader sequence. And uh, to tell you the truth, I don't know if anybody owns a patent on this. And uh, hopefully we can get our... Uh, this practice of patenting genes had attracted considerable criticism. We that. have less than 10 life science companies in the world that have a virtual lock on the seeds upon which we all depend for our food and survival. The issue here is, can companies like Monsanto use their control of intellectual property to force the rest of humanity uh, to accept their terms in the commercial arena? Monsanto was sitting on a mountain of intellectual property. They held 28% of all U.S. agricultural biotech patents. This knowledge had cost them an estimated $7 billion in research, and anyone wanting to use this technology had to negotiate a license. What do you call, what's the name of this papaya? Lawyer Mike Goldman thinks that's fair. Our patent system in this country is based on the Constitution, which rewards those that invent with the opportunity to use that technology as they see fit. So in my view, given the amount of money and effort uh, that goes into research that is needed to develop this very complicated and important technology, there should be a return for that. But this defense of intellectual property, some critics argue, appears to contradict the claim that genetic engineering is merely a continuation of traditional plant breeding. I think the problem the biotech companies have got is that they want to say they're extremely different so that the um, genetic material can be patented uh, and that it's very novel, whilst at the same time saying, well, they're pretty much the same uh, in order to get the foods through on the basis of substantial equivalence. And I think that, that really doesn't wash. Uh, either they're different or they're very similar, um, but it seems like the biotech companies really want to have it both ways. Urged by Gonzalez that time was running out, Goldman began the job of getting licenses. 
I had my doubts that we would be able to get the intellectual property right, especially from Monsanto. Monsanto was dealing with big issues, soybean, cotton, and so forth. And papaya was just one of, it just so happened that they had uh, intellectual property rights, and we had put it into papaya, and they really were not interested. So in as far as them thinking about it and so forth, it was not in their priority, but it was in our priority. Monsanto was distracted by other things. For there were signs that the European concerns about GMOs were spreading to America. was on the frontier of biotechnology. Most of its scientists were excited about the possibilities that GMOs offered. Then in 1999, the campus became embroiled in a bitter controversy involving one of the most celebrated symbols of nature. Every year, the monarch butterfly makes a long journey to Mexico and back. On the way home, it stops to feed and lays its eggs on milkweed. For milkweed leaves are the only food young monarch caterpillars eat. In thinking about the monarch, a young Cornell entomologist, John Losey, realized that the only milkweed available in the vast American corn belt grows in and around cornfields, many of which now contained BT corn designed to kill caterpillars. Losey was curious whether the closeness of the milkweed to the BT corn would affect the monarch caterpillars. So he decided to do an experiment. Losey took milkweed leaves and dusted half of them with regular corn pollen and half with one variety of BT corn pollen. Then he placed monarch caterpillars on the leaves and let them eat their fill. What we found was the caterpillars feeding on those leaves dusted with the BT corn pollen, they ate less they grew more slowly and they suffered higher mortality. More of them died than in the other two treatments. 44% died over four days and none of the others died. The ones eating the regular corn pollen or the no pollen, none of those died over the four days of the treatment. Losey published a letter in the British scientific journal Nature. We thought that it certainly would generate some interest what we certainly weren't prepared for was the, the level of, of uh, reaction to the paper, and I don't think I could have ever been prepared for that. For the first time in the history of GM food, the American press paid attention, from local newspapers to Time magazine. It was the first time, I think, that the public uh, had an image of what could be the consequences uh, of genetic engineering in a sort of a user-friendly, family-friendly uh, butterfly, uh, which most Americans are very familiar with. Greenpeace's U.S. office had been waiting for something like this to ignite the GM issue in America. Their coordinator was Charles Margulis. We feel that this is a mass genetic experiment that's going on in our environment and in our diet. Nobody knows what the consequences are going to be, and the untoward side effects will be irreversible. Uh, you can't recall genes once they're released into the environment. The monarch scandal energized Greenpeace USA. They began looking for dramatic ways to tell consumers that their food had been changed. We pulled food products off the shelves and tested to see if they contained genetically engineered material. And our, uh, one product in particular, a Gerber baby food, uh, tested positive uh, for genetically engineered corn and soybeans. We sent Gerber a letter and let them know that uh, Greenpeace had concerns about genetic engineering and we thought consumers would share those concerns. Gerber didn't respond to us. So we decided to go public with our findings. And uh, a few weeks later, 
Gerber announced that they would stop using genetically engineered ingredients in their products. I think it showed consumers that when they want to, these big companies can move overnight. It doesn't take years of government regulation. What it takes is for these companies to fear that they're going to lose a little bit of their market share. At press conferences, Greenpeace exposed other food companies that routinely used GM corn and soy. Well, it took Kraft, a potential loss of a $50 million a year product, to call for some more regulation. Of After Gerber, What's it they zeroed in on Kraft, Campbell's, and Kellogg's. As in Europe, they staged stunts, targeting brands built up over generations. There goes... As in Europe, they filmed the events themselves. Is Mr. Gutierrez into them? What have you done to my cereal? They're fake! Sir, you can't say that. See, this is Frank and Tony. He's very upset because he's genetically modified. But I'll ask you guys to wait out here. And I'm going to come right down for you, all right? Please, please. What have you done to my cereal? They're fake! Such demonstrations haven't so far attracted much media attention. Creating public awareness has been harder here. But recently, the public awareness has increased, and I think uh, the situation in the U.S. now is very similar to the situation in Europe a year ago. I was a little disappointed we didn't get to talk to anybody in the executive suite. It's been nice to be able to let them see what they've done to me and what kind of a monster they've turned Tony into. Call Bill Duggan, tell him they're over here at Serial City, and we've got the police over here. This is a city sidewalk. I, am, uh, I need your uh, driver's license, sir. Small though some of these demonstrations were, they seemed to scare the $600 billion food industry. No one wanted their brands to be tarnished with the image of Frankenfood. Greenpeace is here to send a clear message to the Kellogg's Corporation that we need pure food. We need pure food in our breakfast tables. We need pure food for our children. Stop the use of gen genetically modified organisms. While the U.S. food industry hasn't been hit here as hard as in Europe, no one wants to be targeted. None of the major food companies was willing to participate in the making of this program. We can't grant an interview, because we do not want to be singled out. It's not our issue to fight. It's an industry-wide debate. It is an industry-wide debate, and it's not in our best interest to participate. We cannot confirm whether or not we use GMOs in our products. Biotech is a very promising science. We don't see any evidence that the technology is unsafe. However, we do not want to be singled out. Good morning, Grocery Manufacturers of America. Instead, the companies chose Gene Grabowski of the Grocery Manufacturers of America to speak for them. Food companies have learned that the groups are not intent on having a reasoned debate about biotech or helping consumers find out about biotech. It seems that their motive is to, is to scare people. I don't dispute some of their research. I don't dispute their motives. What I dispute, and I think what the industry questions, is the tactics. The street theater, the antics, the attempts to gain publicity at the expense of truth gets a lot of attention. That shouldn't be confused with how broad the movement is. We have not seen any indications through any surveys that, were, that they represent uh, the vast majority of consumers or even near a majority of consumers. We have all the monarchs gone, died because of genetic crops. When will they ever learn? When will the monarch had become a powerful symbol. But how much science was there behind the rhetoric? Back at Cornell, Losi had been dragged into the contentious debate surrounding biotech food. And he was forced to defend his conclusions, point by point, against his own scientific colleagues. In the lab, monarch caterpillars fed leaves with Bt pollen died. But out in the field, 
things were more complicated. The real question is, what is the effect out in the field? There's a whole series of events that have to occur to really make this a significant risk. Bt corn pollen is fairly heavy, so it doesn't travel very far. That's certainly true, and, and that's uh, one thing that, that I think has been shown since our paper came out, is that the, the pollen really doesn't go very far. So if there's going to be an effect on the monarch, it's going to be probably within the cornfield or within a few yards of the cornfield. You've got to realize milkweed is a weed, and growers try and control it. It's actually on the federal list of noxious weeds. So you don't find a lush population of abundant milkweed inside a cornfield. But Losey disagrees, saying that in most cornfields, there's plenty of milkweed. A substantial proportion of the milkweeds that exist anywhere actually exist in cornfields. So the, the, this idea that there's not milkweed in cornfields, that's it's just not true. Challenged by Losey's paper, researchers are trying to discover if out in the field monarch caterpillars really do eat enough Bt pollen to do them harm. This has turned out to be a very complex task, and so far, there are no conclusive results. However the science turns out, Losey believes more tests should have been done before the EPA approved Bt corn for widespread use. Where the system fell down a little bit is that there weren't more tests done on, on these non-target butterflies. There should have been more data collected but biotech companies counter that the press had missed the most important factor. Bt pollen is certainly less damaging than traditional ways of controlling the corn borer. Like massive spraying of chemical pesticides, killing not just caterpillars, but every insect in the field, including monarch butterflies. If crops like Bt corn are banned, then I think um there will be increased pesticide use that will have some deleterious effects. Even Lucy accepts this would be a bad thing. If you have the choice between putting out the BT, which is very specific to, to just Lepidoptera or to butterflies, and spraying with an uh, insecticide, which generally is uh, fairly broad, you know, is going to kill almost all the organisms that are out there, then you are having less environmental impact almost undoubtedly by using the BT than by using the insecticide. From corn to cotton, biotech companies have tried to portray GM crops as highly beneficial to the environment. BT cotton has really been a, a breakthrough in how insects are controlled in the crop. Historically, the crop was sprayed eight to ten times with insecticide, usually flown over the top of the crop. Today, um, the cotton crop is grown with one or two applications. But the biotech industry will first have to earn the trust of environmentalists. One of the things you have to realize is that the big biotech companies were originally agrochemical companies making pesticides. They still do. The reason why they got into biotechnology is that they could see the end of the market for pesticides. Now, of course, the argument is, well, this is not as bad as the synthetic pesticides. Well, I don't think it is, but do we really, do we want to replace one technology that is harmful to the environment with another technology that's harmful to the environment? Pesticides weren't always thought to be harmful, to the contrary. In 1947, Time magazine carried an advertisement claiming DDT was good for people, homes, and farms. It took 20 years before scientists realized how dangerous it was. So if you just replace that with, biotechnology is good for me. See, these same people who once told us that pesticides were good for us are now saying, well, those pesticides, they're, they're dangerous. But you take, take, take these biotech products, they're much safer. I think that there are a lot of people who finally believe that we're not farming the right way, we're not producing food in the right way in this country. Farm. 
It's very different from most modern industrial farms. Instead of two crops, California farmer Paul Miller grows 70 on just 200 acres. And everything is grown organically. This is a field that's one of our fall plantings, and it's not a very big field, it's about six acres. Um, it has a variety of things that we grow in here for harvest and marketing all fall. We have broccoli, we have cabbage, we have different kales, um, hardy winter greens. There's some beets over there and some red cabbage. On this side we have lettuces and onions and chard and things like that. Miller sells fresh produce to people who share his belief that farming should be done in a sustainable way, in harmony with nature. Although more expensive and accounting for less than 2% of all food produced, it's a growing trend. When people are given the choice if they'd rather eat uh, food produced with toxic chemicals and pesticides, food produced with genetic engineering, or food produced organically, people choose organic food time after time in survey after survey. What is organic farming? Instead of herbicides, Muller uses sheep to clear the weeds. He has no chemical fertilizer. Instead, he uses compost. It's not a natural process what farming is. It's, it's far from it. And so we're trying to minimize the amount of harm done and, and maximize the amount of health in the system over the long haul. And that's why we believe some of these, these tools are better tools than, than chemical fertilizers. But there is one product that Muller uses from time to time to control pests, something that's pitted him against the biotech industry, the organic pesticide known as Bt. A hundred years ago, Japanese silk farmers discovered that a soil bacterium, Bt, produced toxins that killed their silkworms. Organic farmers later realized that this bacterium might be useful in killing caterpillars. Today, they spray a Bt formulation on their leaves. The Bt that we use is very specific. It uh, doesn't have a very long life. And we use it sparingly. We may only spray a field like this once, once a year, once a season. And we don't use it unless we have to. For a long time, organic farmers had Bt more or less to themselves. Then a decade ago, the biotech industry began splicing various Bt genes into crops like cotton and corn. Companies like Monsanto thought environmentalists and organic farmers would be happy. Monsanto says this is a leap forward. We're ending pesticides. Well, yes and no. Yes, they're ending the use of pesticides, but now they're introducing more toxin than they ever introduced with pesticides. You have to think of that corn now as a factory producing toxin. And, say critics, this toxin will cause a worse problem resistant pests. It's not a new problem. Pesticides have never killed every last pest in a field. There's always a small number with genetic variations that resist the poison. Because these survivors eventually repopulate the entire field with resistant descendants, over time, pesticides stop working. A field of Bt corn potentially makes this situation worse. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day, the corn puts out Bt, killing most, but not all, corn borers. The resistant survivors soon repopulate the field. The Bt is now ineffective against those pests. By engineering Bt into corn, they're taking a tool away from farmers over the long haul that Bt will disappear as an effective tool for a farmer like me to use. And it will be something that Monsanto, or whoever's developed the corn um, that has the Bt gene in it, will have captured the profits, captured all the future benefits of that, and put that in their pocket in a very short period of time. Resistance is something that we take uh, very, very seriously. We've made investments in these technologies for a decade. So it's in our interests to make sure that they last for another 10 or 20 years.